Hello, and welcome back to my Beast Wars retrospective. Today we're going to be looking at the third and final season in the series. If you haven't seen parts one and two yet, here's the link in the corner. Now then, allow me to set the scene. It's 1998, and Mainframe Entertainment is hot off the heels of three great successes in animated storytelling, with Reboot's third and, for now, final season, Shadow Raiders' premiere season, and, of course, Beast Wars' second season. The third kicks off on October 24th to great anticipation, and while the show is still one of the best on the block for children's programming at the time, it does quickly become apparent, at least for me anyway, that this season's got some issues. That's not to say Beast Wars writers are doing any worse of a job than usual, however. They're operating here the same way they always have. The ship that is Beast Wars story gets sailed by the writers in more or less whatever direction they want, as long as they navigate around all the buoys of mandated inclusions made by Transformers intellectual property holder Hasbro. Specific plot points like characters being introduced or killed off, stuff like that. The difference this time around is that there seems to be a lot of indecisiveness on Hasbro's end as to what direction the property was going. Hasbro really didn't quite know where they wanted to go. It was very hard to get a solid decision from marketing because they, they themselves were trying to figure out exactly where they were going with this show. Effectively, Beast Wars is heading into its third season with a creative team subject to the whims of Hasbro that must be adhered to despite being constantly in motion. For that reason, I have to commend Beast Wars writers for mostly pulling it together in the end. With all that out of the way though, let's dive right in, shall we? Season 2's finale left the fates of pretty much every character besides Megatron ambiguous with most of the Predacons destroyed or otherwise incapacitated and the Maximals in the process of being erased from history. You no longer exist! Well, of course that doesn't end up happening. The Maximals are fine and there aren't any deaths on the Predacon side either besides Ravage, who didn't even have a toy at the time and wouldn't get one until the following year. Tarantula survives the destruction of Ravage's ship despite experiencing the blast firsthand. Meanwhile, Inferno bounces back from complete disintegration looking just sort of beat up like Wily e. Coyote after a stick of dynamite blows up in his face. That's actually an appropriate tonal comparison for a lot of Beast Wars season 3. There's a new emphasis on including funny asides this time around, and I do think the more comedic tone works overall, with many genuinely funny moments throughout. When expecting booby traps, <laughs> Duh. Always send a boob in first. Boobies. Again, it reminds me a lot of Looney Tunes humor, which I've always been a huge fan of. By the end of the series, Waspinator, Inferno, and Quickstrike have basically turned into a comedy triple act in the vein of the Three Stooges. Waspinator even gets some character development out of it. Hey, Waspinator, happy at last. I will admit, though, that I probably would have preferred it if the show had kept the tone a little more mature, like it was in Season 2. This is speculation on my part, but I get the feeling Hasbro was a bit nervous about how mature the stories and themes of Beast Wars' second season were, and told the show's writers to lighten it up a bit. Ah. Hey, you emasculating fembot! Oh. For kids. The only real downside to the more comedic tone is the relative lack of complex, multi-part story arcs like those of Season 2. Instead, this season is mostly made up of standalone episodes, including two different Save the Kid stories, one of which is a replacement for the cancelled episode Dark Glass, which would have seen Rat Trap attempt to resurrect Dinobot by transplanting a backup of his memories into Dinobot 2, only to learn that this was ultimately impossible and that his old friend was gone for good. As previously mentioned, this episode was cut by Hasbro for being too dark and not having enough action. That's not to say there aren't some really solid episodes in the third season, though. Hey, this is, uh, kinda cool. The episodes Deep Metal, Proving Grounds, Crossing the Rubicon, and especially the two-part series finale, Nemesis, were all great watches and stand above typical kids' cartoon fare. Though, in my opinion, there's nothing in this season that quite reaches the height of Code of Hero or Transmutate from Season 2. My only major issue with the plot of Beast Wars Season 3 is that entirely too much time is spent upgrading members of the cast to newer bodies in order to sell toys to the audience. Season 2 got this out of the way right up 
up front, introducing nearly everyone's new forms all at once near the beginning of the season. Season 3, on the other hand, opens with Primal's transformation, but then the next upgrade, Cheetors, doesn't occur for another five more episodes. For those keeping track, that's almost halfway through the 13-episode season. Finally, the remaining two upgrades don't come along until nearly the end of the series. In fact, Megatron, the leader of the baddies, only gets to stretch his new dragon wings for one complete episode before the show's finale begins. This was because unlike the previous Transmetal and Fusor lines, this latest wave of Beast Wars toys, Transmetal 2, was still not yet finalized when Season 3 began production. The largest Ultra-class toys from that wave, Megatron and Tigerhawk, took longest of all, which is why they don't appear on the show until right at the end. If it had gone more smoothly, as in Season 2, then these cast changes could have been handled up front without needing to devote 7 out of Season 3's 13 episodes to introducing new toys, even if some of those episodes did end up being pretty great. It was really hard for Takara and the toy team to to get the modes right. And when you got into robot mode in Beast Wars, you had a lot of big parts kind of hanging around. So they really had a very different silhouette. The concept of Transmetal 2 is monstrous, asymmetrical bodies with machine parts poking through the otherwise mostly organic forms. This was also the first line of Transformers to feature the Insignia Crystal, which would become a staple of the toys for the next few iterations of the Transformers franchise. The upgrade is considered in-universe, by Cheetor anyway, to be ugly, but I personally like the look. No, the thing that annoys me about the Transmetal 2 forms is the way most characters receive this upgrade on the show. At some point before the episode Feral Scream, Megatron comes into possession of the Transmetal Driver, a mysterious alien device that can upgrade Cybertronians to a newer, more powerful form with psychic powers and can also bring them back to life. If this MacGuffin seems a bit silly to you, you're right, but the real kicker, kicker! is that Megatron finds the driver off screen and it's never explained when or how he got it. Data unknown device is of alien manufacture. To make matters more irritating, because of the Transmetal 2 delays, Optimus Primal is sidelined from the action by some contrived means in nearly every combat situation throughout the season, since his latest form, Optimal Optimus, would have been too big and overpowered for the bumbling, ineffectual Predacons to stand up to while Megatron's new toy was still being fussed over by Hasbro and Takara. Speaking of being removed from the action, this season sees the return, sort of, of Tiger Megatron and Air Razor, two characters who the last time we saw them were quite literally being written off the planet. I gave Air Razor a bit of a hard time in my Season 1 video, but the point I was trying to make there wasn't that I didn't like her, it was that I felt she kind of got the short straw out of the cast. Air Razor was one of the final characters to be introduced in Season 1, and while her introductory episode, The Spark, is great, she barely features in it until the last few minutes. Following her introduction, Air Razor does very little for the rest of the series besides help out once or twice when a flyer is needed and hang out smelling the flowers with Tigatron. There were originally plans for a Season 1 episode that would have featured Air Razor and Black Arachnia leaving their respective groups to start a neutral girls-only club, but this was scrapped before production began. Eventually, she and Tigatron got shuffled off to basically stay out of the way until the time came for them to be written off. Tigatron definitely fared better than Air Razor in the character department. I actually quite liked him. He was a more subtle character than most of the other Maximals, and it was an interesting idea to write a pacifistic nature lover onto a show called but I will admit, back when the show was actually on TV, and I was part of the actual target demographic, I didn't really care about Tigatron, and if I had any opinion on him or Air Razor, it was probably just that they were boring. Regardless of how you felt about either of them, they're back! The catch is that they've been merged into one being, calling himself Tigerhawk, who shows up at the 11th hour in the third to last episode of the series, only to die almost immediately because Hasbro kept going back and forth on whether they even wanted to release the Tigerhawk toy. Nevertheless, despite his appearance being brief, I found Tigerhawk to be a welcome addition to Beast Wars. He certainly got a unique backstory and set of abilities. I just wish that, like Air Razor before him, he'd gotten more of an opportunity to grow as a character. The main contribution that Tiger Hawk makes to the story of Beast Wars is to put a name and a face to the mysterious aliens that have been dropping in on the cast periodically throughout the series, now called the Vok. I am Tiger Hawk. 
emissary of the Vok. To be honest, I've always kind of thought the Vok were a bit of a mixed bag. On the one hand, they're these super mysterious, powerful, ancient aliens, and they're neutral in the Beast Wars, which makes them a threatening presence to both sides. On the other hand, the Vok's apparent motivations are pretty inconsistent in each of their appearances, and I really wish they'd gotten more of a payoff, especially in regards to their prior hostile relationship with Tarantulas, who in my opinion also needed a better payoff than what he got. Tarantulas goes from being one of the most intriguing characters in Season 2 to more of a background presence than anything else in Season 3. Again, like the Vok, Tarantula seems to suffer from inconsistent motivation. In Season 2, he described Megatron's plan to alter history by killing Optimus Prime as madness, but here he seems pretty keen on blowing up the Ark with all of the Autobots and Decepticons still inside it. You're insane. So they say. <laughs> I guess he just figures it wouldn't affect him much? He claims that his heritage is neither Autobot nor Decepticon, and there is one offhand line by Megatron which many fans have taken as evidence that Tarantulas is descended from Unicron, the planet-sized villain of Transformers the movie. Ah yes, incipient treachery from Unicron's spawn may yet turn the tide. Though the comment was originally intended to be a derisive insult rather than a literal statement about his heritage, it would later be retconned to mean that Tarantulas was in fact a member of a secret group of Unicron's creations who have infiltrated Cybertronian society. How Megatron would have known any of that is totally beyond me. Tarantulas is already dead when the line is spoken, so ultimately it doesn't matter. I, I wish I'd seen a little bit more of that. But of course it wasn't about him. I mean, I'm surprised that he's as well-loved as he is, so I'm, I'm pretty happy. But yeah, if the show had been all about me, it would have been fantastic. <laughs> yeah! The other Spider-Bot of the series, Black Arachnia, played once again by Venus Turzo, is one of the better aspects of this season. She fills a similar role here to that of Dinobot last time around. Black Arachnia's arc sees her coming to grips with the fact that after foiling Megatron's plan to alter history saving the Maximals, Black Arachnia has effectively joined the Maximals, a fact that she's initially not willing to admit to herself. Her Predacon ideals and temperament are aspects of her identity that she fiercely wishes to hold to, despite under understanding that she was reprogrammed from a Maximal protoform to begin with. After all, being a Predacon is all she's ever known, and the prospect of losing track of her self-identity scares her, even if that identity was given to her artificially by a cackling madman. <laughs> This culminates in her reluctantly deciding to undergo a procedure to remove the shell program making her a Predacon from her body. You mean I had a choice? That is the Maximal way. The Predacons cause enough of a ruckus outside the Maximal base to interrupt the procedure at a crucial moment though, and Black Arachnia dies on the operating table, so to speak. A tragic end to a conflicted character. But then the Transmetal Driver brings her back to life and upgrades her so she has a new toy, except she's just a generic good guy now and she'll never be as interesting as she used to be ever again. Even if I'm good, I'm still bad. Yeah, Black Arachnia's character is somewhat undermined by the inclusion of the shell program. If her Predacon traits can simply be uninstalled, why couldn't, say, Dinobots earlier in the series when he was feeling conflicted? I know Dinobots' circumstances were slightly different, but the point stands. This plot device reduces conflict over allegiances to simply another mechanical function of the Transformers. Overall, though, I would say that Black Arachnia's character arc is easily the best of the season. But I wasn't the only one to take notice of Black Arachnia in season Season 3 of Beast Wars, a large percentage of Cheetor's story revolves around him hitting Cybertronian puberty. No, really. Now those are what I call lines. This arc is strange. A coming-of-age story was a neat direction to go in a Transformers show, and one that had only really been done once before with Hot Rod in Transformers the movie. I'll straighten you out yet! If you ever pull a stunt like that again, I'll have your tail in a sling. The difference here, however, is that Cheetor getting older doesn't manifest itself in learning a life lesson or gaining new responsibilities, but in becoming self-conscious over his changing body and developing a crush on the cute girl in class who his buddy is totally already dating. Yes, times have certainly changed for young Cheetor since season one when girls were still icky. You don't know what fast is, furball! <laughs> I know what ugly is, and you're it. Cheetor also starts to form a rivalry ish with Silverbolt over Black Arachnia's affections, but it doesn't really go anywhere. I'm sick of your stupid crush. 
He even keeps a photo of Black Arachnia in his bedroom, which is a little weird. There are some really funny moments that come of this story, and it gets points for originality, but it doesn't do much for me overall. Cheater was the character you probably would most relate to if you were a 14-year-old watching the show back in the day. Now those are what I call boobies. Cheetor would actually get a more traditional coming-of-age arc in Beast Wars' follow-up series, Beast Machines, but that's a topic for another day. As for new characters, Beast Wars Season 3 introduces Depth Charge, a disagreeable Maximal who was previously the leader of an off-world Cybertron colony until Rampage, the crazed experimental Protoform X, destroyed it and killed all of its other inhabitants. Depth Charge is single-minded in his pursuit of revenge against X, having tracked him, somehow, back in time to prehistoric Earth and the Beast Wars. He's kind of like a robot Captain Ahab who transforms into a manta ray. Depth Charge doesn't take orders well, and never truly considers himself to be under Primal's command. He does grudgingly align with the rest of the Maximals for most of the season in order to stop the greater threat of Megatron and his time travel shenanigans. We've had our differences, but you and I both know that this is bigger than both of us. But will usually drop whatever task is at hand for an opportunity to go after Rampage. Fall back until their arrival. Blow it out your exhaust port, Optimal. X is down there. Death Charge's arc culminates in what else but a fight to the death against Rampage, sacrificing himself to finish the psychopathic monster. A grim but fitting end for both characters. I think Beast Wars writers did a pretty great job with Death Charge. He's a memorable, if not one note, character in the few episodes he appears in, though he does get a bit of time to interact with the other Maximals. He even seems to form the beginnings of a rivalry with Rat Trap, which echoes the latter's turbulent relationship with the late Dinobot. Switch that! Glide mode or something! I don't have a glide mode mouse. Speaking of Dinobot, he's back too. And he's evil again! A clone of the original Dinobot, creatively named Dinobot 2, is made by Megatron and upgraded to a Transmetal 2 body courtesy of the Transmetal Driver. So don't worry folks, you've got a new toy to buy. Dinobot 2 is given life by the severed half of Rampage's supposedly indestructible spark, which Megatron had previously been using to torment him into submission. That role is now taken over by Dinobot 2, though it's never made clear why the torture only hurts Rampage and not him. Dinobot 2 possesses none of the original Dinobot's memories, or his spark, or anything really besides his name and face, and serves as an unflinchingly loyal enforcer of Megatron right up until the finale, where he inexplicably takes on facets of the original Dinobot's personality, such as his sense of honor, after Rampage blows up. I have my honor. This doesn't really make much sense, since once again, Dark Glass was cut from Season 3. That episode would have established that the evil influence of Rampage's spark over Dinobot 2 would be too powerful for OG Dinobot's consciousness to gain dominance of the body without a spark of its own, and would be suppressed at the end of the episode, only to reawaken at the critical moment of the finale once that evil influence was halved in power with the destruction of Rampage. For this reason, the events of Dark Glass are considered canon by some fans, since without those events, Dinobot Dinobot's influence over Dinobot 2 at the last second is a pretty big plot hole. If I had to guess, I'd say the Dinobot became so popular over the course of his fantastic Season 2 character arc that Hasbro instructed Beast Wars writers to bring him back so they could capitalize on his popularity with a new toy. Season 3 doesn't really add anything to his previous character arc, since this is technically a whole different character, though I'll admit it's nice to hear Scott McNeil get a stab at playing Dinobot as a straight-up villain for a bunch of episodes. Which was I went. Well, I think the voice should be the same, but he's just meaner and nastier and darker. You know, it's just accessing another angle of the same character. Beast Wars finale, Nemesis, brings writer Simon Furman on to help develop the overall story as well as to script the second part of the episode. Furman had previously been an author and editor on many of the 1980s Transformers comics published by Marvel, and would go on in the future to write several Beast Wars tie-in comics as well as the first five miniseries of the highly acclaimed and ongoing Transformers comic series by IDW. He and Beast Wars co-developer Bob Forward originally planned for Beast Wars' third season finale to be a three-part episode, which would lead into a fourth season, reportedly set to take place in outer space, a plot thread you can see remnants of in the final product. At first it was just this was going to be an episode somewhere in season three. Then we knew that at least this was going to be the final two-part at the end of season three. Unfortunately, they were told late in development that the show would be cancelled with no fourth season, and that Larry Dottilio and Bob Forward would be replaced
replaced as showrunners on the follow-up series. So, you know, the script had to be revised, scenes had to be dropped, new scenes had to be brought in, and then it went back to Bob and Larry and the producers, and it probably went through about another sort of three or four drafts. Well, come on, let's have it. The usual destiny and honor speech. Speech this. <laughs> Nemesis is still a really good episode overall. It introduces the Covenant of Primus, an ancient Cybertronian religious document apparently recorded on audio cassette tape, which Optimus Primal has now realized the Beast Wars are fulfilling the texts of. While the Covenant of Primus may be a bit out of left field as a plot device, its many passages quoted throughout the episode lend a certain gravitas to the proceedings, which feel appropriately epic. And you will know my name is Megatron when I lay my vengeance. Upon you. And you will know my name is the law when I lay my vengeance upon thee. However, the brevity of the closing scene is a bit disappointing, unceremoniously concluding the show with Megatron strapped to the outside of an Autobot shuttle the Maximals just figured out that they had headed back to Cybertron. The abrupt cancellation was once again due to Hasbro's indecisiveness, however, to their credit, this was the only season of Beast Wars where its writers were even told whether or not the show would be renewed to begin with. I'll take it, at least it's not another cliffhanger. So that pretty much does it for Beast Wars Season 3, but hey, we've got another couple minutes left in the video. Let's take a quick look at some Beast Wars extras. The show was not only popular in North America, but also overseas, particularly in Japan, where a very, very loosely translated Japanese dub had basically turned the show into a parody of itself. <laughs> This strikes me as an oddly humorous reversal of the silly, inaccurate English dubs plaguing the first several anime series to go mainstream in the West around this time, such as Pokemon, Digimon, Sailor Moon, and Dragon Ball Z. You just wait till it grows back! In Beast Wars Japanese dub, every character has a silly sounding vocal tick or catchphrase, usually shouted exaggeratedly and constantly as they fire their weapons. The script was also jazzed up to include lots of Japanese puns, pop culture references, and fourth wall breaking jokes, such as a running gag where Rat Trap would pretend to sniff out what the kids watching the show were having for dinner. Characters and dialogue were just more over the top and zany overall. <laughs> Oh, and uh, also Air Razor was a dude. Rhinox-san, ですね. Japan also produced a traditionally animated spin-off of Beast Wars called Beast Wars 2, which actually aired in between Beast Wars first season and seasons 2 and 3. Beast Wars 2 never officially aired in the West, but nonetheless it and its sequel series Beast Wars Neo are both often considered canon by various comic books and other official supplementary works. Like Beast Wars Japanese dub, Beast Wars 2 had a much more lighthearted and comedic tone than the original show and is aimed at a younger audience. Later on, several Transmetal 2 Beast Wars toys of characters who weren't featured in the cartoon series were given new names, color schemes, and were recycled for use in another Japanese Transformers anime, Transformers Car Robots, known in the West as Transformers Robots in Disguise. This one, not this one. Finally, though, we come to the end of an era. Beast Wars' third season may not have been the best of the series, but it was still pretty damn good overall. I realize, however, that I'm running the risk here of portraying Hasbro as some sort of terrible boogeyman who ruined the series, which is absolutely not the case. So I'd like to clarify that it had to have been difficult deciding what to do next with the franchise. In the early to mid-90s, the Transformers brand was essentially dead, staying alive mostly through its early online fandom. Year over year, we notice a slide and a decline. So you get to the point in the early 90s where there really wasn't much of a brand, uh, didn't have much of an awareness. Other brands, more superhero based brands, had come in and taken over the kids' mind share. So, in order to kind of reinvigorate that brand, they took the bold step in changing them from cars and trucks and planes to apes and dinosaurs and bugs. Beast Wars had essentially resurrected the brand, but if I were Hasbro and Takara, I definitely wouldn't have wanted the brand to hinge on a single television show until it wore out its welcome. Branching out and trying new things was a must for the franchise to firmly secure its newfound foothold in the pop culture zeitgeist. Hasbro and Takara have always been 
partners on the Transformers brand. Each of us lead our own independent investigation of what could be next, and then we share those ideas and come to an agreement as to what we should do as a group and what we would do individually. At the end of the day, series developers Larry Dottilio and Bob Forward, the rest of the writing team, the cast and crew, and of course the folks at Mainframe Entertainment were still able to create together one of the best kids' cartoons of its time, still worth watching today. Despite the show having ended nearly 20 years ago with comparatively few references to it included since in other Transformers media, Beast Wars is still considered one of the best iterations of the franchise, and it's no wonder why. As far as a place in my career, Beast Wars has just got a big warm spot in my heart. I don't think I've ever had so much fun working on a series. It all came together in Beast Wars for me. Excellent cast. Probably the best I've, I've worked with in, in all of them is that cast of Beast Wars. Working with the ensemble cast of Beast Wars is probably the most fun I've ever had. It really is kind of my fave show I've ever done. It's the only show I've ever worked on where I became kind of a fan of the show. I was really into the series. I loved the characters. I loved the humor they put into it. I thought it was great sci-fi. I got many, many letters on Beast Wars, on episodes that touched people's hearts. I almost want to cry. I almost want to apologize. I almost want to say, I'm sorry, a lot of the time I was just like jamming something out, you know, uh, uh, I, if I'd known it was going to like affect you this much, I would have worked harder at it. The fact it's gone on this long is, uh, is amazing and I think it will continue to do so. I'm a guy who wants to have fun and Beast Wars was fun for just about everyone. It certainly looked back on a heck of a lot better than its follow-up series is, which would go down in Transformers history as one of the most controversial and polarizing of the franchise's many shows. That's right, kids, next time the seeds of the future lie buried in the past as we take a look at the one and only Beast Machines. Thanks for watching! If you enjoyed this video, be sure to hit the like button and subscribe if you're new for more content like this in the future. Leave a comment down below letting me know your thoughts on Beast Wars Season 3, the series as a whole, Beast Machines, or anything else. I've also got lots of other videos up on this channel for you to check out at your leisure. Thanks very much to all of you once again for watching, and take care.